everyone. Recording in progress. Um, now, engineering materials, how the properties are affected or how the structures are affected when we do some kind of processing on the material. Now, when we talk about the material processing, we do consider costing, forging, rolling, machining, or heat treatment and other properties. Now, usually we perform these functions or these uh, processes on metal, either in the as a primary forming or as a secondary forming processes. The primary forming process when we are creating the material, the secondary forming is like when we are enhancing or changing the properties of the material. Now, what actually happened to the material uh, during the casting? On the x-axis, you can see it's a time. On the y-axis, it's a temperature. When you add the molten metal, uh, you pour that one, what will actually happen initially the material will try to cool down quite quickly. There will be a sudden change in temperature. And then it will reach at a freezing point where the metal will try to convert into solid metal. And then when the solidification ends at point B, then you can actually see the metal will try to cool down. So that's the stages. Depending how fast or slow the cooling is, the grain structure will be different. So we will have a different grain structure. Now solidification time. Solidification time depends on the mold. These are uh, uh, Chovinov's rule. So we talk about that one in a minute. Initially when the solidification happens, a thin skin will form. And when the thin scale will form, the, the material will try to solidify all the way inside. The greater the surface area is, the faster the solidification is. Now, solidification is given by this rule. Ts equals C bracket volume divided by the surface area, where T is the time of solidification. N is a constant. C is a constant that reflects the mold material. The value of the N, it depends on a metal, is between two and 1.5. So if you have a look at, uh, if there's a surface area is more, if you look at this time formula, if the surface area is more, the time to solidify will be less. They are inversely proportional. But if the volume is more, the time to solidify will be more as well. Here yeah, they are directly proportional the volume and the time to solidification. Okay, when you cast the metal, it doesn't solidify straight away. The metal that's closer to the mold will solidify quicker as compared to that's far away from the mold. So temperature drop at the start at the, uh, where we, uh, the mold is, mold wall will be quicker which will foster the change in temperature as compared to in the center. Center of, if you are able to find the center of gravity or just find the center of the mold, that will be the last specimen, last uh, liquid that will convert into solid. Now, the way it works is initially to the closer to the wall, it solidifies. After it solidifies closer to the wall, it starts to form these dendrites. They start to form. And these dendrites will grow. They will interlock and so on. Okay. Now, what will actually happen is then we will have a non-homogeneous casting because we will have a different grain structure. We will have multiple grain structure. We will even have the composition different. We will have a different composition at the wall. We will have a different composition at the center. So we want to do another process called... Uh, removal of segregation or homogenization. We need to homogenize the material. And there, there's a process we talked about that one. Which means it will result in non, not very different, but still different properties, like hardness will be different at the start, hardness will be different in the middle and so on. 
Okay. There are two type of segregations. Costing, there are segregations happen. What's the segregation is? Segregation is one type of uh, element try to segregate at a at specific point, and this is called segregation. If I want, let's say, a 0.1% carbon steel, I want this carbon uniformly distributed. I don't want to be segregated only on the surface or at specific uh, point. So there are two types of segregation that happen. One is called the macro segregation, another is called the micro segregation. Mac micro segregation over occurs over distance comparable to the size of dendrite arm spacing, the spacing between two dendrite, which is here you can see there are two dendrite spacing between the two arms. Okay. Macro occurs over a similar distance to the size of casting. Now, macro segregation occurs because of multiple reasons, because of the shrinkage. Um, anything that cools, obviously it has to shrink, so there will be shrinkage. Um, there will be a difference, variation in density of the liquid as the solute partic uh, par uh, particles are precipitated uh, or separated. Um, now, in casting, we need to prevent the micro segregation. We need to prevent a uh, macro segregation. Um, why? Because we want the uniform properties. Otherwise, our properties will not be uniform. Okay. There is a process called homogenization. Um, the way the homogenization works is if, if we got a segregated, um, that uh, if, let's say, I am create, I, I just casted a pellet of let's say one meter diameter. That's a quite big one made up like a steel. If I do the properties, if I just do the carbon content at the very end and the carbon content in the center, they will be different. So I want to segregate. So I will heat it at some homogenization temperature. Uh, we can get the homogenization temperature from iron carbon phase diagram. And then I heat it up. I just leave it there for a long period of time so the molecules, they will just move around and they will just distribute themselves fairly in a homogenized way throughout the billet, throughout the casting. Okay, so it's called diffusion, solid, solid diffusion. Now, macro segregation, um, they occurs over larger distance. So it's kind of difficult to remove uh, by the homogenization way. To do that one, we need to control the casting. We need to make sure we have done the casting. When we uh, do the casting mold, we need to design a mold in such a way that there are proper heating and cooling things going on. So the end part, let's say if I'm designing a mold and uh, I'm pouring a liquid, the liquid goes to the very end. But as the liquid goes to the very end, what will actually happen is the liquid is already cooled all the by flowing all the way from point A to point B. So maybe multiple entry points for the liquid, we can put that one, or maybe the design of the mold in such a way that mold walls are thick or thin, some where it can, it can extract less heat from the liquid metal, it can extract more heat from the liquid metal in such a way so the liquid remains flu fluid throughout the whole process. Okay. Sometimes we use an ultrasound to break up the dendrites that can grow. So what actually happened is we have an ultrasound around the mold. And as we are pouring, we fire up our sound waves. Now sound waves will break these dendrites and they will not form. And hence we can get rid of micro segregation, but how big the equipment we need for the uh, to generate the ultrasound, that's a different thing. Now, properties of casting. Now, defect, there are certain defects in the casting which needs to be eliminated and which can affect on the property uh, of the casting. One is dendrites, one's inclusion, one's a porosity, one's a shrinkage. Dendrites, we talk about the dendrites. Inclusions are, let's say, I'm pouring something um, and maybe there is a flake that actually fell into the casting and that flake won't be bonded together. So that will cause a defect. And when I test the mechanical properties, it will not be good. Then we have a porosity. Let's say I pour that one and 
there might be chemical reaction that have, ha occurs. There are tiny micro voids, micro pores, like an air bubble entrapment, that trap. For that one, we need to make sure we just pour the liquid with the optimum velocity, not too fast, not too slow. Too slow, you're going to lose the heating. Too fast, maybe air bubble will entrap. So porosity, we also need to make sure there is not any chemical that goes inside which will react. When it reacts, what will happen is it will actually generate uh, some kind of oxygen, hydrogen, anything, and that will stay there as a bubble because not all the bubbles will have enough time to come up on the top. Remember, top is cooling at a very fast rate, the surface, and they will, they might just because they have no density, they will come up, but they will not be able to break the boundaries. They will entrap and hence resulting in, in uh, lower uh, properties. Shrinkage. When anything cools, it causes shrinkage. And these shrinkage need to be eliminated. We need to design the mold in such a way to get real shrinkage. So, um, okay. Now, obviously this will affect the strength. This will have the overall effect on the strength. Now, so we need to do the quality control afterward to find out what is the quality you can choose certain material, certain specimens, like every 50, every 20, every 100, depends on are you providing, are you doing the constructive or destructive testing? Okay. Now the next bit. Okay, this is forging. So you can actually have a look at the green structure. The green structure, if you have a look, is in a specific direction. So it goes all the way up. This is one of the reasons the, the grains are aligned in the direction where we need more strength. There's a very nice video. I just put that one online, like just for you to have a look. Okay, so this is the forging process. Now, it aligns. Oh, it's not showing on yours one. Okay. Okay, I put the link then. I think it's, yeah, no worries. So I just put the link later uh, where it's gone. Uh, where it's gone here. I will put the link for you later, sorry. Now, what actually happened with the forging? Forging, when you do the forging, which is a hot forging, let's talk about hot forging, you hit that one and just hammer it and you convert into a different uh, shape and size. If you have a cold forging, that's different. Hot forging is a little bit different. The material is very hot and you convert that one into kind of like a bolt, nuts and so on. The, the forged nuts are more expensive than the drawn nuts uh, or bolts. The reason being is when you have a forging, you align the microstructure in such a way that that's where the maximum properties are. So you, that is stronger on that side. So we need the actual properties. And they are a lot better quality, hence a lot expensive. Okay. Now grain flow. Grain flow is the direction, uh, orientation of the metal grains. Now we align the grains in such a way that where we need the properties. A long, a knee, individual grains are elongated uh, with a plastic deformation. Now I'm just going to show you like why it is good. Now mechanical properties are achieved in the line to the grain flow. We can increase the impact toughness, ductility, fatigue strength. We can just have that one in one direction. Crack propagation. If we know the crack, that's the direction of the propagation of crack because we know this is the direction where the load will be applied and we can actually have the grain in that specific direction which will give us more strength. Okay. To get the maximum or optimum strength, stress, it occurs when the grain flows are perpendicular to the direction of the applied force. So if I want this thing to be like nut and bolt, I will have the nut and bolt in that direction. 
So the grains are aligned. So this is where the stress is being applied. So it's not going to fail. What's the advantage of forging? Uh, it can refine the grain structure. It's a lot better than casting or machining because the grains are aligned in the direction, uh, in the shape of the component. Now, casting, they have an isotropic grain structures. So in one direction, it might be stronger in compression, but it might be weaker in tension the other direction. But this, by doing the forging, we align the grain structure in a way where we need it. It's more reliable. Uh, we can include a higher fact factor of safety in the design and it gives you the uniform properties. For example, let's have a look at this one. This is rolling. So let's say we got a ingot we got from the factory after molten, we cast it and we got the ingot. That, that is the ingot. Now with this ingot, I want you the rolling. When I do the rolling, this is what will happen to the grain. I'm doing the hot rolling. So this is still hot. This is the grain structure. When I press, it will align the grain. You can see the grains are get elongated. Because it's still hot, now here there's a thing called new grain formation will occur. And the new grains will form. They will nucleate. Nucleate mean like they will form. When these new uh, grains will nucleate, they will actually grow because they are still, still cooling, isn't it? So it's still hot, so it will grow. So then we have a recrystallization. Yeah. So start from here, heat it up, and this is our recrystallization. Recrystallization, as compared to that one in this example, it's much smaller as compared to the proper original grain before the rolling pass. But have a look at the in God non uniform grain, which is given. Okay, okay now these are things called uh, isotropic and isotropic. Now, anisotropic is depends on the direction, property of being directionally dependent. For example, composite materials, they are directional. They have directional properties. In one direction, they are strong. In other direction, they are not strong. You must have seen that one like a packing material um, or uh, honeycomb. Honeycomb, if you stand on honeycomb, you can stand on the, from the top. It will withstand your load. But if you actually apply the force in this direction, they are super weak. They are directional properties. Directional properties are linked to the Miller indices. Now, what are Miller indices? We will have a whole session on that one and I will, I will discuss that later. Okay, so, and these are things called isotropic properties and isotropic, which means they're not dependent. Turbine blades, if something has a green structure, it, it is usually like isotropic properties, depends on which direction the grains are, depends which are, where direction I'm loading. Now, anisotropic properties are the property doesn't depend on that one. If I have a single grain structure, it has only one grain structure, so it's, it's an anisotropic. Properties will not be affected which way I'm applying the force. Now, uh, turbine blade, Turbine blades, they are single grain. The reason we make turbine blade of single grain is because we want to get rid of the fatigue and the creep kind of behavior um, failure. Okay. Now, this is the microstructure. The first one is the as drawn. Uh, sorry, undrawn, sorry. The second one is, uh, the, the bottom one is after the first pass. So you can actually look at the grain and the grain boundaries. So um, these are the grain boundaries you can see. It's quite difficult to see. Now, after the second pass, you can see what happened. And the third pass, you can actually see the direction of the pass. They are actually, you can see the kind of the beef mark thing goes that way. These are under 2000 magnification, so 10 micrometer, just to give you an idea, very high magnification. If we do recrystallization, when you actually heat, what will actually happen is it will distort the grain structure and it will make it a weaker slice. Weak slicization actually occurs when you heat something, the grain structure, let's say you go back into 
uh, some of the region, let's say it's austenitic region, and then try to cool it down. When you try to cool it down, what will actually happen is the material will try to recrystallize. So it might be original structure will return. If you are doing the rolling of the product, what will actually happen? Just as we discussed, the nucleation will form, nucleation will happen, and then the new grain boundaries and the new grains will form and they will grow. Now, effect of temperature on the material. Let's have a look on this axis, Y X axis, we got temperature. Y axis, you got three factors, residual stresses, strength, and the grain boundary. Let's have a look at the grain boundaries and the temperature, grain size and the temperature. If you're doing the cold working, yeah, and you're in the recovery phase, that this is how the grain structure look like. Now, recrystallization, the new grains will form. And later on, if you increase the temperature further, the grain will grow. Yep, so you can see the grains are growing. So I'm just looking at the very bottom one. Strength. Now, let's have a look at the strength. For the strength, you can see three different lines. Yep. One's for strength, one's for ductility, and one for hardness. So strength, hardness, ductility. The white BMW 66 plate. You know, I didn't think it'd be awesome. Why is nobody owning up for a white a free white BMW in the world? Is it yours? You man, I wish I I can claim it. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> if you can claim it, you can go move it. Is that my lap? It's my lap in the way. Yes. Anyway, okay. Now, when we have a look at the strength uh, and uh, temperature. Oh. Sorry, yeah. So when we have a look at uh, strength and the temperature, if you increase the temperature, the strength will go down. Initially, it will go down quite quickly. Then after that one, it doesn't matter. The strength doesn't matter. Yeah. So this is the strength. Same thing with the hardness. So if there is a hardness, of the material, it's hard, but after that one, it suddenly will drop. So these are the first two, the blue lines, the first ones, um, the strength and the hardness. They are, this is strength, this is hardness line. So they will go down. And after that one, it doesn't matter. The material has already lost its hardness. It can't become more softer uh, than that. The tility increases with the temperature. So if you're increasing the temperature, the ductility is will increase. Now, then the next one, the third graph is the residual stresses and the temperature. Whenever you do the cold working in the material, it's you build the stress into the material, tempered glass and that kind of thing. Uh, cold working, steel cold work, it you are building the stresses into the material. We need to get rid of these stresses. So we do kind of annealing, tempering kind of process to get rid of residual stresses. When you heat that thing, the residual stresses drop. After that one, the residual stresses become zero because there are no more stresses. Now, then there's a thing called a homologous uh, temperature. Homologous temperature uh, is a temperature that we can actually use uh, to perform different functions, uh, different things on the different processing on, on, on a different metal, um, and it, it has to reach that temperature. For example, for cold working, T over Tm should be greater than 0 0.3. Now, what is T over Tm? One is a working temperature and other is a melting temperature. Yeah. Warm working, is between 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. Hot working, it should be greater than 0 0.6. So for example, if you're doing a hot working on a steel, and let's say steel has a melting point of let's say it's more than 1000, let, let's just for simplicity, let's say it's 1000. Okay, so it should be hot working, the temperature should be around more than 600 degrees centigrade because this, this is 60%, yeah, 0 0.6. Otherwise you won't be able to do the um, hot working. Okay. Now, if you do the cold working, because the cold working 
you are building in the regular stresses. The materials are harder. The materials are stronger. The materials are less the tight. Why? Because the grain structures are distorted. They are already in tension. So first you need to release the tension by performing some kind of tempering or kneeling. Or, okay. If you do hot roll product, the hot roll product are less hard and they are more ductile. They are less brittle because the grain structure, they are already recrystallized. Yep. Okay. Now, then we have a look at the effect of machining on the structure. Okay. What actually happened is when, let's say we got um, an equipment workpiece. So this is our workpiece, the blue one. And then we got a gray one is the two. There is a way uh, where we actually apply, where we put the two in at a certain angle and the tool has to remove certain amount of material in second. So we, we look at that one as well. It depends on, on different factors and so on material angle, velocity, how fast it's moving and uh, how what is the angle it's actually making. So we, we have a look at that one later. Now, when we do the machining, it will affect the microstructure but it's not going to alter the macro properties of the material. Surface property will change, but not the macro properties. Now there are, there will be like automatically kind of heat treatment that will done on the material. What will actually happen when you are doing the machining, sometimes you got a, like a rainbow color on it. Late, you're working with late. The reason that actually happened is because the material get really heated up at, because when it's cutting and if the velocity is so high, the material is cutting and you're cutting the material, the material get really, really hot. When the material get really, really hot, obviously it's been air cooled. So we are performing kind of like automatic normalization, yeah, or, or closer to normalization and so on. Now, how does the microstructure look like? Forging, if you have a look at the forging, the best microstructure in terms of the directional properties we can get. Grain flow, they are aligned and they, they, it's to improve the ductility and the toughness and the fatigue. This casting, the grains are formed, tiny, teeny grains are formed everywhere. They have grain bombs and so on. Do not have desired grain structure. Machining, unidirectional grain flow. Yeah, because I just cut it from here. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. So if I'm doing machining to that one, after forging, if I'm doing, let's say machining, it will remain the same microstructure. If I'm doing the casting and I just using the machining of the casted product, it will have the same microstructure. Now with machining, it remain, it, there will be, it's prone to the stress corrosion cracking. Stress corrosion cracking is, you must have seen that one. If you put a nut and bolt, there's a piece of sheet and you put a nut and bolt, you super tight it. That's under a lot of stress. And when it's under a lot of stress, this is the part where it starts to corrode first. So when we do, when you use nut and bolt on a on an metal, the first thing we have to do is make sure they are exactly same uh, material. If you can't have that same material, doesn't matter. Let's say I got a piece of steel and I can't find any, let's say it's a washer or any more nut and things like that. And I said, okay, uh, Nickel is really good, or I say, oh, brass is really good. Or I, if I don't have any, I can use a two penny coin, drill a hole and use that one. Now, two pence coin on its own, is really good corrosion resistance. But when you actually attach it to other metal, it creates a kind of galvanic cell, which means it will fasten the corrosion because it creates a galvanic cell. One thing will corrode faster than the other, depends on which one is more uh, reactive. Okay. Now heat treatment, how does it affect the microstructure? Let's have a look at the annealing. What will actually happen to annealing? Let's have a look at the annealing and quenching first. Annealing the grain structures, we are giving it time to go. It's annealing is a super slow cooling. 
So let's say you leave it in the furnace, you heat it up, leave it in the furnace, turn off the furnace, the micro, the grains, they are going to grow because you're giving them time and temperature to grow. They will grow until they come to the kind of like a room temperature or so on. So the grains are going to, the bigger the grains are, the softer the material is. Hence the annealing, the material is softer. They are more ductile, yep, okay. And we use that one to release uh, internal stresses. Normalizing. Normalizing, we give them less, actually before normalizing, let's give, um, okay, no. Let's say we got quenching. Quenching, we don't give it enough time, the grains to grow. Straight away we quench in water. The grains are not going to grow. Temperature drops from 900 straight to 20 or room temperature. In that case, the residual stresses will be there, which make the material hard. Other thing is uh, the top surface of the material will be more harder as compared to its in annealing. Now normalizing, when we do the normalizing of the steel, now when you're cooling it down, what will actually happen is it will form, iron will form a BCC structure. There will be residual stresses, but that will be kind of released now hardening, hardening is another process. Um, we can do two different ways. We can either add a molten metal, when melt the metal and we can add some alloying addition, or we can do some heat treatment depending how we're doing the hardening. Case hardening, we discussed the case hardening previously. Case hardening only change the hardness of the case. And there are different ways of doing case hardening. Tempering, we use tempering to increase the toughness. Um, we do that one after the hardening process or after quenching process. We get rid of the internal stresses where we heat it up to certain temperature and cool it slowly. Sometimes we do tempering uh, just by blow torch, yeah, slowly, and then we heat it up and just leave it there. Glass, when you make glass component, it has to be tempered. If the glass is not properly tempered, what will actually happen is a little bit stress and will just break. Thermal stresses can cause failure. Effect of welding on the grain structure. Okay, whenever you do a, doing the welding, the welding is um, creates the thing called heat affected zone or HAZ in short. Okay, now. Let's have a look at this one. This is a graph between temperature and original temperature of the base. So let's say what will actually happen. So if I got the component here, the first point, that this will have low temperature. This is where I'm welding, fusion zone, weld uh, metal. That's, so as I move closer to that one, the high temperature is there but further away from the dark blue, the temperature is less. So less temperature, and as goes here, the temperature is more, maximum in the middle. And it repeats, it's symmetrical on the other side as well. Now, properties of the welding component. If I'm doing the hardness, if I'm doing the hardness, if I just grind, polish and everything, and I start doing the hardness, I will get the different hardness at different grade. If I cut that one, do a cross section, and if I try to find the hardness here will be different. All the hardness will be different. The heat affected zone change the properties of that material. It sometimes make it brittle as well. So after if you do the welding and straight away you put a water on it to cool down, that's no, no, because you are quenching it. When you quench, you're making them, uh, the well brittle and after certain stress cycle or maybe the first stress cycle, it will just crack. Okay, um, I will show you this video in a minute uh, to production. Okay. Now, when we look at the design for manufacture, we need to look at not only the design, we need to look at the process and we look at the material. So we need to find the optimum of these three. We need to find the best possible way where we can have a combination of both. Sometimes the design does not, does not help us to choose certain materials. So we're going to ignore that material. Sometimes 
we cannot do certain process on so I cannot do, let's say, uh, uh, forging uh, kind of thing on plastics. So obviously, I can't, I will get rid of that process. I can get a better design, better design if I'm using material X as compared to the material Y. So I can choose that. They're all linked together. So we need to find a best possible way which one to choose. <laughs> Okay, I will stop here and I will show you some videos as well. Just let me stop the share and stop.